Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Washington Yoto Ocheng. I'm, I'm honored to be the current head of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering here at Imperial College London. I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of our president, Hugh Brady, our provost, uh, Ian Wormsley, and our dean, Nigel Brandon, to welcome you to our department and uh, to the 48th annual Pavius Lecture. Uh, in our midst, we have our students, and we've got also the Arkwright scholars uh, joining us today. Please feel very, very welcome. We are proud of our students and scholars. Now, due to the popularity of this event, uh, there are more people registered for the lecture than seats in this room. So we are actually uh, delivering or live streaming this lecture into other rooms within this building. Um, so today is our biggest event yet. I mean, that's probably worth a round of applause. And, and so whichever room you're in, um, if our evacuation alarm sounds, please leave the room and make your way out of the main entrance of the building. Turn right and congregate at the base of the Queen's Tower. Uh, and it's near to the Anthony Gormley sculpture. It's a, an interesting sculpture. You, you can't miss it. Just outside. <laughs> So the organization of this particular lecture is a joint effort between our department, um, the Worshipful Company of Paviers, and the Institution of Civil Engineers. Now it's now my privilege to introduce the master of the Worshipful Company of the Paviers, Mrs. John May, to tell us a little bit more about the Paviers and to introduce the speaker. But before you come over, John, I'd like to say a few words about John himself. So he qualified as a solicitor in the city and took up various positions in the city of London and Westminster. He became the head of a commercial property department at a leading Knightsbridge firm before setting up his own practice. He is a solicitor and not republic. John has been a member of the Pavius since 2003, where he has been a long-serving member and chairman of the Pavius Charity, where he has particularly promoted a support for the London Construction Academy, providing a route to employment in the building industry for those not in employment, education, or training. His relationships with our military affiliates, particularly with 29 Squadron RAF, have led to him flying supersonically in their Typhoon Eurofighter aircraft. So supersonic and Typhoon in one sentence. <laughs> As a practical pavier, John has organized his neighbors in the private uh, road where he lives to convert what had appeared the relics of trench warfare into a finely paved roadway. <laughs> he now seeks guidance on slowing the speed of traffic that has resulted, and I know a lot about that as a, as a transport specialist myself. So John, it is my privilege and honor to request you to speak briefly about the Pavius and to introduce <laughs> our speaker today. So welcome, John. Washington, uh, thank you very much indeed for um, having us back to what is now the 48th Pavia's Lecture. Um, the Pavia's are now in our 748th year, having been established in 1276, and um, we are by a measure the senior of the construction livery companies in the City of London. And um, uh, these days, in the 21st century, the majority of what we do is related to charity, and the majority of our charitable activities are connected with education. And this lecture is the senior part of that, and it is a great privilege to come back to here today. But we also perform an assortment of other educational activities uh, at different levels with Arkwright scholars. Some are here today with Budding Brunels at a uh, slightly more junior level and uh, with the London Construction Academy, which Washington has mentioned, which is where we take people who are long-term unemployed, not in training, and give them the, uh, the basic skills to go to work on a building site. 
and this is something that turns people who are not able to enjoy being in, uh, in, uh, in the world uh, into actually being active members of it. And uh, some of these have then progressed to become students, and perhaps one day some of them will come to your department, Washington, to, uh, to learn at the highest level. Now, uh, Imperial College started in 1855 and um, funded by the Great Exhibition. Can you imagine a public event that was so successful that not only did it pay for itself, but it uh, also provided enough money to endow the learned institutions along Exhibition Road, including the Imperial College where we are tonight. And um, I see if that Imperial College is the best place in the world to study engineering. Um, I know this because it is on the, uh, the college's website. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the author of the quotation is a young student called Tim Chapman. <laughs> Um, so um, we, are in, we are in good hands here now. Uh, now, Tim is our lecturer tonight, um, a pioneer in um, uh, the, the change infrastructure. Um, uh, he recently moved to Boston Consulting as a director after long service with Arabs. And um, uh, during his career, he has already led the engineering of global infrastructure for the last quarter century. He's guided the industry on carbon reduction and um, has set the current global standards for this um, activity. Um, Tim's work is, was honored in 2014, becoming a fellow of the Royal Academy of, in, uh, of Engineering, as well as being a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Engineering's and has many further distinctions. We're delighted to welcome you as our speaker because uh, this is um, an exciting time for the industry as engineers are asked to, uh, to provide answers to many of the world's challenges, such as climate change, infrastructure resilience, and rapid um, uh, urbanization. A fresh approach to infrastructure provided is um, helping to meet these issues from the ground up. Um, I know this because I found it on the uh, Royal Academy of Engineering uh, website, um, and the author was Tim Chapman. <laughs> so, Tim, you are very welcome tonight, and we'd very much like to know how you feel things have changed since you wrote that 10 years ago. <laughs> Tim, you are very welcome here. First of all, um, whoops, I'm going to make a few sides. First of all, um, are all three of my mics working? It's sort of it's a, it's a great honour to be back. Um, for those of you who uh, were here in 1986, 1987, which isn't everybody, um, uh, I had a very enjoyable year here, um, which didn't do my liver much good, but I did learn quite a lot. So um, I'm very happy to endorse uh, Imperial College as the best engineering university in the world, um, and I'm sure it's true because I must have said it. Um, <laughs> So can we rely on engineers to save the world? Um, and actually, Washington and John have set this up really well and probably set me up really well as well. Um, and I think we're at a really exciting pivot time in terms of world history. Um, some of the stuff that we read in the press is really depressing, but actually um, the world is now coming to rely on need engineers all the more because the big challenges that are coming up and which you got a sneak preview of a few seconds ago um, show the fact that we actually need to do things in very different ways from the way we used to do them. The first probably 20 years of my career were probably quite linear. I became sort of a very expert geotechnical engineer and actually just went to Peter Rutty and others in the audience of, uh, fr from, from those days. Um, but actually, the obligation of we all have now is to actually solve problems that are not well defined, which are very different to the way we did. So actually, geotechnics, I think, was a really good introduction for this because, again, it was an ill-formed science when I first came involved with it, um, but it slowly got codified over the years. And actually, the same thing applies to a lot of the challenges we have at the moment. We need great engineers to come along. And to some extent, again, some of us who are older will not see the full extent of climate change. A lot of you here will see it much worse than I will. That's not because I'm hoping to die or anything else quite soon, but um, some of you have got several decades ahead of me, and some of the effects of climate change are going to be much worse in your lifetime than will be in mine. 
So can we rely on engineers to save the world? The answer is obviously partially, uh, but actually we need conservative skills, but engineering ones are vital and are significantly underrepresented. I did a few checks to try and actually work out which global leaders have engineering degrees, and it was really embarrassingly bad. Um, I think there's only one MP who's a chartered engineer, um, Chi Amora, um, who's I think Newcastle, or certainly Tyneside uh, based, and she does some great stuff. But actually out of the 650 MPs, there's only one chartered engineer. An awful lot of other professions, but we need an awful lot more people who understand these things more. Again, I mean, Lord Robert Mayer is a very prominent Lord in the House of Lords, and I was trying to find any more, and I couldn't find any more um, uh, engineers of his gravitas who are in the House of Lords. So in, a deba in, in, in two chambers of almost 2,000 people, there may be two. I would love to find out if there's actually any more, but it might be maybe four if I was going to be optimistic. And again, around le world leaders, I, I asked the famous ChatGBT um, to, to, to try and help me with this, so it must be true again. Um, maybe it's more or less reliable than my old quotes that John found. Um, uh, Jimmy Carter was, a, was, was an engineer, a naval engineer. Um, and actually, depressingly in here, Herbert Hoover, that great sort of um, uh, mover of um, America after the Great Depression was an engineer, they put Vladimir Putin down here saying, although he had a law degree, um, he's overseen much technology and engineering in Russia, which um, I was interested in. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and other neighboring countries as well. And they also pick on Angela Merkel, who served and said, although she's not an engineer, she's got a PhD in physics, she's almost an engineer. Um, <laughs> and again, going further afield, and again, sort of using history, um, uh, uh, Mao Zedong, I think, was an engineer. And again, um, uh, but it, it's a bit iffy. I think engineers like playing Sim City and like, uh, and probably make better dictators than, um, uh, than democratic leaders. <laughs> So it's something to think about a little bit. But, but, but I, I will still make the point very strongly, we need more engineers in influential positions. Um, um, but we need to actually possibly behave a bit better when we get there. <laughs> Um, the other point I was going to make is actually, th these are the UN SDGs, came out in 2015, um, and actually to some extent they're a sign of massive progress. Um, SDGs 1 to 9 are largely about outcomes, and the world has done hugely well on S most, of, most aspects of them. The amount of advancement of humanity since um, about 1800, the Industrial Revolution, has been huge. Unfortunately, we also trash the planet in parallel. Um, and um, climate change is a, is a very major one, and we need to do a lot about that. But actually, biodiversity potentially is worse. Climate change may not make us extinct, but biodiversity could do. Um, so there's things to actually think about of the big challenges over the next sort of certainly 30 years out to 2050, um, uh, but going beyond that out towards um, the turn of the century when some of you guys will still be alive. Um, and people are talking about sort of 2060s, 2070s as the time it gets a bit, um, a bit more interesting. I also quoted in the flyer for the lecture, um, a guy called Jay Inslee, who was governor of the state of Washington in 2013, said, we're the first generation to feel the impact of climate change and the last generation to could do anything about it. And Barack Obama picked up that quote, and I found it hugely actually inspirational. But back in 2014, 10 years ago, back to the time of John's quotes, um, it wasn't true. We didn't actually were feeling it at the time. The amount that we've actually felt in the last 10 years of big changes, I think, are really scary. So therefore, it is the fact that we need to do something really quickly, and we need to do an awful lot in parallel together. Climate change, biodiversity, actually social value, social equity, resource scarcity, um, and overall resilience and adaptation are a whole lot of parallel challenges we need to address at the same time. Just transition is also important. I mentioned social value, but actually just transition is something that we need to do in two ways. One, nationally, and this is just basically sort of the, um, across the UK, the parts which um, uh, of households living in extreme poverty, and some places are up to 50%. I mean, how can this place take place in one of the richest countries in the world? But it's this disparity that I find depressing. But again, the engineering solution should be about more transport, more mobility, making sure that people can move around, people can actually get access to better jobs. So again, the answer is engineering for this. And globally, it's very easy to pull the ladder up after ourselves. We live in a developed country. We live in a country with, with generally very good infrastructure. We mustn't make sure we deprive the developing world of the right to be the same way that we do. 
Um, Keith Clark, who used to be head of Atkins, said that basically a fridge was one of the major signs of civilization. And every family deserves a fridge. Because when they have a fridge, they have the entire supply chain that reduced, that, 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 that gives a fridge. You've got um, cold food coming from supplier to the end point, a level of logistics, which is actually huge, again, provided by engineering, and a level of stable power supply to make sure that the contents of the fridge remain, um, uh, remain active for the whole time. And everybody in the world deserves access to a fridge. And this seems like a really basic thing to say, but actually huge parts of the world don't have that even now. And therefore, it's trying to work out how we make sure that just transition takes place both nationally and globally while we solve these problems. So it's not just a matter of saying we're going to stop road building or stop air transport, because if we stop air transport, large parts of the world are condemned to live very poor lives. And A, that's awful for them, but also leads to a very unstable world, huge migration, um, and an awful lot of other bad things happening. So we need to make sure that just transition is a key part of what we do. So civil engineers, I will argue hugely, are vital in all of this possibly apart from when they become global leaders. Um, big systems thinking, thinking about system of systems, belief in physics. Again, lots of climate change things I see at the moment are actually not necessarily correct and they're not grounded in physics. We need to make sure that engineers provide the basis for making sure we make the right decisions in the future. Deep technical skills, but also soft skills, possibly better soft skills than we've employed in the past. And actually, again, talking to Washington beforehand, teaching soft skills and learning how to interact as part of a broad team, working respectfully with other disciplines, not disdainfully, recognizing the part that all other disciplines have to bring. And lots of people we need to work with. Um, I put legal and financial, not just because John's here, but actually we need to work with all the other professions to make sure that we provide complete holistic answers and not just technically correct ones, but they may not work in the real world. This is a very bad slide. Um, uh, BCG has not yet taught me how to do PowerPoint properly, and I'm sure there's probably people in BCG who, tomorrow who will teach me how to do this better. But I was actually musing going back to the start of the Industrial Revolution that in a way, during the middle of the 19th century, a, a huge amount of things happened. I mean, all the railways, canals, and um, the sort of things that laid the foundations for the modern world, modern cities, sewers, um, the start of electricity. And engineers were absolutely critical in those stages of making sure that these new systems could be rolled out everywhere. During the previous, or during the last 150 years, maybe we've only become vital and not necessarily critical, but I think we're actually critical again for finding and devising the solutions that are required. And again, in terms of trust in professions, Trust in, this is a, 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 an Ipsos Mori poll from about um, a week ago, saying trust in politicians has reached its low score in 40 years. Politicians generally are at 9%. And I was trying to work out who are the 9% who still believe in them, but that's, a, that's probably a separate <laughs> issue. <laughs> um, but but I, I do believe in democracy, um, and therefore, uh, what did Winston Churchill say, the worst, possible, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the worst possible system, but better than all the others. Um, but engineers are here at 85%. We still have the trust of society. And that's something we mustn't take lightly, and we must actually make sure we honor and live up to. And therefore, I think we need to step up our game in terms of making sure not just that we come up with great ideas, but that we actually follow them through, working with society to make sure they get embedded properly. So we've got a great opportunity, but also a risk that we mustn't squander. And again, I was asked to just reflect on my career. So again, um, as many of you know, I'm an imperial old boy. I came and I say, spent a year um, in this very building uh, learning to, dr to drink and soil mechanics, um, although I was quite good at one of them before I came. Um, uh, I was originally from University College Dublin. Um, I obviously became chartered with Engineers Ireland and the ICE, um, and then became a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering. I had a 36-year career with Arup, and actually hugely enjoyed it. And Arup was a firm that, taught me t that, that, that gave me the opportunity to learn and taught me lots of stuff. And I would, my advice to the younger people here is actually when you're looking for a firm to employ you, find somewhere that's going to teach you. And not many firms teach you. Lots of people will employ you, but actually find somewhere that's going to give you the experience and enable you to grow in different ways. And Arab gave me that. So I was originally a geotechnician, a dealing with real estate. I then got into big infrastructure. I first got into climate change um, as a challenge. I was asked to help design a black ski run in Abu Dhabi. And that got me thinking because someone called it uh, net zero. And I was trying to work out how on earth a black ski run in Abu Dhabi could be net zero. Um, and it got me understanding actually some of the, fal the, the fallacies in our standards that people could even think that that was a thing you could do. 
Um, so that got me, that my, my curiosity peaked, um, and I started trying to work out how um, we could apply sustainability and low carbon thinking to big infrastructure. And more recently, uh, wishing to be in a way have more influence, um, uh, Boston Consulting Group offered me a job and I snatched it because the chance to try and work on a bigger stage in many more countries and influence things became really important. I'm 58, um, uh, so that my, my, that my time of influencing is more limited, and therefore I wanted to try and make sure I could, I could do an awful lot more to try and change things. But I put this down in a way just to sort of give people an idea that A, you can stay working for a company for 36 years and still enjoy it, um, uh, and B, the fact that actually you can have a varied career as well, um, and making sure that you can have fun at all times is really important. And again, in terms of advice to a graduate, um, this is sort of the famous T-shape. Um, the sort of the breadth of knowledge and depth of knowledge. Imperial College is going to give you great depth of knowledge. Um, and the chance in your career afterwards to actually go out and actually learn lots of things working for a good employer and make sure that you can become a global expert in your field. And again, Peter and I were just musing before this about actually whether enough firms are teaching people enough and giving people the chance to actually get involved in the nitty gritty of things or in a way whether computerization processes are beginning to erode that deep experience that people have and whether it's actually um, uh, how we're going to follow it through. But breadth of knowledge is also important. Making sure that we can actually follow things through. To some extent, it's all personality shaped as well. Some people will be superb being deep and only deep, and that's not a problem. But some people actually can thrive by being T-shaped. But my one point on T-shape is you can't become T-shaped by being broad and then deep. I don't know anyone who's ever done that. I think the only way to become T-shaped is to become deep and then broad afterwards. But again, that's something possibly for questions. Oops. It's only water. It's not the uh, beer I was talking about. So, um, uh, so um, uh, but, but, but curiosity matters and m wide reading matters no matter which shape you actually decide to follow. So it's a pivot time. I mean, again, this is the old Kitchener quote from World War I of your country needs you. I put your planet needs you. Um, uh, there is a great need for a huge amount of engineers who can go out and actually not just bring great deep knowledge, but also make sure they work with other professions to make sure they apply it broadly in what we do. And I've just put down actually some things. Extending current technologies, I mean, EVs, smarter grid, and lots of aspects that actually follow from that, really clever batteries, making sure we get nuclear to work in all its ways and small modular reactors and things, making sure we actually pivot the technologies to actually make sure we get to a proper low carbon system that doesn't destroy the world. And actually within this, the amount of rare earth metals and other uh, critical raw materials we need could also be off the scale. And how do we do this in a way that actually is much more respectful for the world of, than previous gold rushes? Also inventing new technologies. I've got direct air capture, which I think is one of the really interesting things, and fusion. Um, and I've just actually put some of the things here about the European Union strategy for industrial carbon management and the number of megatons of CO2 that the, um, they plan to sequestrate in the European Union every year, hopefully up to about 450 to 500 megatons. And I'm going to talk later on about actually scale and units. As engineers, we learn about units all the time. We learn about meters, we learn about tons, we learn about kilonewtons. But actually, I think people get lost in the units of climate change. And therefore, one of my key bits of homework I'm going to give you all later is to actually understand the units of it, and especially the metric system, because kilotons, megatons, gigatons, gigatons per whatever, all become really confusing. And if we don't actually engage in the units, we can't understand the message. If someone says something is um, three meters deep, we all understand that. If we say it's three furlongs long, some of you may remember it, but not very many. <laughs> Um, or how many fathoms in a whatever. Um, so actually, if, 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 but, but climate change is, is uh, currently spoken like that. The units are really confusing. But you need to have a common reference basis, like the foot or the yard or whatever, to make sure you understand it. And looking at this, I recognize that actually getting up to 450 megatons for the whole of the European Union might be really good. However, that's only current UK emissions. Um, and the EU is roughly 10 times bigger. In time, the UK should once get down to about 70 or 80 megatons of emissions, but we do know that won't, be, that won't happen. We're going to miss that. We're not doing enough. To some extent with climate change, humanity is great in a crisis. And again, talking to Melanie earlier on about World War II, I mean, 
humanity came together in three years, more or less, to defeat global fascism. Um, and 70% of the resources of the world went into the effort to try and make sure that we did it. But at the moment, we're arguing about putting even 1% of our resources into thwarting some of these issues. We're just not taking it seriously enough. One of the issues is climate change isn't happening uh, too quickly. It's actually happening too slowly. If it was happening more quickly, we would actually be able to react. And unfortunately, it's reacting slowly, but the effects are going to have a huge lag to them. And that's something that humans are actually really bad at dealing with. We're very bad at dealing with hazards and risks. And on the pivot time, we need to get better at doing the things we already do well, or should do well, like delivering projects better. We still talk about project overruns and everything else. There's lots of basic science we should do um, to look at this. I did advantage last week of working with some of my colleagues in BCG, trying to work out what are the factors to make sure we just deliver the projects quickly enough. I first worked on Crossrail in 1992. It opened in 2022. I, it was 30 years from the time I first worked on the project until the railway opened. We need to do projects far more quickly than um, Crossrail. We need to make sure we can actually deliver them because actually the, the world needs new systems. Engineers are needed to make sure we deliver better. And again, talking to Washington before this, it was actually looking at the future research in civil engineering. And again, this is probably a very contentious slide. I may get more grief on this slide than any other one. Um, at the moment, an awful lot of things that we do in research have to be very academically rigorous. But that means they're usually very monodiscipline and therefore very limited. It's the opposite of the skills that we're going to need in the future. Once we come across into broader interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary fields, it might be much used to broader society, but also it can become very fluffy. So therefore, there's a danger that we actually worry about the academic rigor of what we're doing. But we critically need research in this interdisciplinary area. It's much more important that we actually make sure that we get lots of new research that actually pivots into much more exciting and difficult areas. It might not have the academic rigor that some hard engineering has, which can be measured in terms of units, and we actually can talk about something tangible that's happened. But actually, the tangibility of doing stuff that's very multidisciplinary is absolutely critical to what we do. And again, I applaud the UCRIC consortium, which I was involved with about six or seven years ago when it got set up, which actually was trying to look at how we UK universities can be far better in this multi-system-based world. So are we doing enough? Are emissions declining? No, is the quick answer. Um, uh, this slide looks at um, the gigatons um, of, um, of emissions through the world, adding up to about 50 gigatons. Um, I'll ask someone later on, I'm going to pick on someone, ask them what's that in megatons. Um, don't worry. Um, uh, but, but basically, all of our systems, you can see the impact of COVID here. There was a mild um, uh, kick down, but it soon recovered. People soon started flying again. Airports are, are recording their highest number of flights ever two or three years more quickly than they thought they were going to recover. Um, uh, industry is back to producing again. Our general generation base, electricity and heat is doing very well. Um, so there's lots of things are actually happening and going up continuously. Here are some of the issues in terms of um, where we're at. Um, and current policies put us on track for about three degrees um, centigrade warming. We know we went through one and a half degrees last year as one year. But actually, if that gets baked in, pardon the pun, um, then we're in big trouble. Um, and to get back down to sustain um, this 1.5 degrees, we need to cut about 22 gigatons per year by 2030. That's about half of current emissions. A huge change in what we need to do. And the longer we leave it, the worse the actual things get. The right-hand one just shows some graphs um, from the um, International Energy Agency of global pathways. And actually, the more the, 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 the more generous the pathway, um, uh, the, the more CO2 we pump up and the more issues we have with trying to solve the problems afterwards. But fundamentally, aren't we complete Egypt for not doing something before? This goes back to my point of actually we're still having emissions going up. We've been talking about climate change in a fairly big way for 10 years, and yet emissions are still rising. And there's two issues for that. There's a delivery gap and an ambition gap. I mean, so the overall trajectory we need, the green line, is the ambition gap. We're following, UK is actually leading on this. I'm very proud of the fact that the UK industry and actually UK politics, which often we characterize as a bit dysfunctional, are putting us in a position to have better policies for these things than most of the rest of the world. Current direction, though, we've got an ambition gap and a big delivery gap. We're not making enough ambition and we're underscoring against the ambition that we have. 
Uh, now, this is graph is a very small scale for reason I'm going to show. This is actually some of the energy transitions that have taken place. The amount of solar that has gone since 2016, the amount of wind power, the amount of nuclear. Um, LNG is a bit dodgy. It's possibly better than coal, but maybe not. Um, again, question one we might pick up in the questions. But these are some of the speed of which we've actually rolled out energy transitions um, over the last, um, sorry, of, of, of some of the things that we actually allowed and we say, oh, isn't this wonderful? We're rolling out renewables at a fantastic rate, which actually we are. However, this is US shale, ga shale gas since 2000. So the amount of extra energy we provided from shale gas is off the scale compared to what we've done in terms of solar and wind. We're burning huge amounts of gas, notionally as a greener fuel, but I'll show you later on, it's, it's still very da damaging and maybe even more damaging than people say. And this just picks up some of the other things. So again, in terms of um, whatever your favorite terawatt hour, exajoules of energy, um, this is just showing the graph of, of energy going up. And even since 1950, sorry, again, I was born in 1965, so I'm just slightly along this graph, uh, we're using about four times as much energy per year as then. Um, so huge amounts of energy going into things and just showing in a way some of the transition. So yes, coal is slowly fading out, but actually other fossil fuels have taken its place. Yes, isn't it wonderful how much wind and sun, solar we have, but actually it's not great. And this is a graph up to 2022. So this is, these are recent data. Emissions in some places are starting to decline, and this island is actually one of the better places which is, has declining emissions. Only slightly declining in terms of our consumption-based emissions, which I'll pick on later. Um, interestingly, um, and again, I've only got a, a book that came out recently by Hannah Ritchie looked at the um, emissions per capita globally, and they may have possibly peaked um, in 2012, um, but we're still, population is still growing, obviously, um, and um, emissions are still going up. In the countries at the top of the graph, there's been some decoupling of GDP and CO2 emissions. So UK, US, EU, Japan and Korea, and possibly Australia and New Zealand is a slightly optimistic um, graph. I'm a geotechnical engineer. I'm with optimistic graphs. Um, uh, I've been trained in how to do optimistic graphs. Um, uh, um, uh, but only a geotechnical engineer might actually have plotted that one for Australia and New Zealand. Other places, there's a, there's a starting of a divergence. But actually, in other parts of the world, Southeast Asia and the Middle East, um, GDP growth and fossil fuel emissions are still growing entirely in tandem. So the heart of the matter is, in the world that I graduated into uh, back in 1986, 1987, it used to be, is it stable, does it work, build it safely, build on time and to budget. Mm -hmm. I've got a picture of Tony Blair standing in front of High Speed One um, in 2003 saying it was a very rare prime minister to stand in front of a sign saying on time and on budget. And unfortunately, that's still the case. Now we have, is it resilient? Is it low carbon? Um, the, all the broader benefits, nature, biodiversity, social value, jobs leveling up. And actually in the future, we got more for less and how can I spend less because the government spent all the money on COVID. So therefore we have a really interesting time in the world of how we're going to actually do all the things we need to do. It's a much more complicated world than the one I graduated into um, 36 years ago. <coughs> many limbed crises to solve and so little time. And there's a really good Korean film um, about six months ago, I can't remember if someone will remind me, called um, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. And that's basically what we need to do. We need to solve all these crises together. We don't have time to do them sequentially. We've got to solve them all in parallel. We need really clever ideas to make sure that we can actually come along and solve all of these problems at the same time. Going back to um, a project, this was um, just after I was born. Uh, people were building the West Way through West London. And actually, this was a heroic civil engineering project. Lots of people got chartered on the back of it. It was thought to be the epitome of great engineering. Unfortunately, it was absolutely tragic for society. It was entirely disconnected to what it was doing. There were some signs of protest, but the engineers carried on um, and applied technical progress, as they thought, into these 
poor backward areas that didn't that that that, that needed modern transport system, and actually we know the legacy that happens here. This actually is a stone's throw from Grenfell. So the deprivation here that led to the Grenfell Tower and ultimately to the Grenfell Tower disaster, you could argue, started with the engineers who trashed the area by putting a motorway through the middle of it. The responsibility that we have last decades, and if we make bad decisions, those the impact of those decisions that last for decades and even centuries afterwards. So therefore, we need to make an awful lot of good decisions in a very short period of time based on good information. And we engineers need to actually listen and be responsible receptive to other voices in society that help us understand how to make sure we do the right thing, but also bring society with us so society will actually support us. We know that actually we have widespread support in society for climate change, but actually it's only skin deep. Um, uh, the Extinction Rebellions, uh, Rebellion that took place in Oxford Circus just before um, lockdown, sorry, I was thinking a glass of water. worked really well until they actually tried getting on top of tube trains in East London and stopped good London is going to work. And then actually, in a way, sympathy started to evaporate slightly. Um, the Gilets Jaunes protests in France were people protesting against climate change measures. Um, and people died in those riots. So therefore, the support of society can't be taken for granted. We need to make sure we do the right thing with people to make sure society understand the things that have been done to them at a rate of change which will be phenomenal and really painful. So the nature of all of infrastructure is systemic. When anyone talks to me about what the outcomes we want to produce, and actually I'll talk a bit more about outcomes later, I always think the purpose of infrastructure is to make people happier, healthier, and more prosperous. Some people might quibble about the more prosperous term, but it's worthwhile thinking about our purpose as engineers. Decarbonisation means changing the system, but not necessarily every part of it. So therefore, it's not the big thing of changing everything, but we need to make sure we change the critical parts that consume fossil fuels um, and resources and everything else. And the system of system impact is really big. Everything is linked. And we have many linked crises, as I explained earlier. So decarbonisation starts with our energy system. So this is a graph from I think about 2019 that shows the UK overall system. Um, transport is about a third of our emissions um, and mainly petrol diesel based. Domestic gas, uh, domestic heating is largely gas based in the UK. Our electricity grid is becoming more decarbonised really quickly. And actually the UK electricity system is one of the huge successes globally in terms of decarbonisation but actually not yet enough. Um, and when you look at the amount of fossil fuels on the system, um, it's huge. And again, I'm very happy to debate biomass, uh, whether it should be actually viewed as low carbon or not low carbon. Um, some people think it is. I'm not in that camp. But actually, um, we need to work out how we get an awful lot more net carbon, uh, net zero carbon uh, power on the grid. And actually then, this segment of the grid needs to expand out as we electrify home heating, as we electrify transport and other types. So we need actually an electricity grid sometimes between two and a half and three times bigger than the current one, and one that's an awful lot more low carbon than the one we have at the moment. And the amount of work required by engineers to do that over the next 25, 30 years is huge. So to the engineers in the audience who are just starting in your careers, you have a massive challenge ahead of you and an awful lot of great, interesting work to do. And how clean is your grid? I mean, Britain on this graph, you can see, is one of the really good performers, just looking at a number of things globally. And again, the data pool I have here isn't great, it goes from 2012 to 2016. But actually, the UK took strides over the four-year period and has taken more strides ever since to decarbonise our grid. But fundamentally, we come to the carbon intensity of electricity generation. And coal is really bad, about 1,000 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Oil more or less as bad. Natural gas is meant to be about half the emissions, but this ignores fugitive emissions from actually people who take the gas out of the ground badly. This is actually just the combustion emissions um, um, at the point at the power station. And if your gas is removed from a in, in a country which doesn't look after um, um, gas extraction properly and doesn't actually worry about fugitive emissions, this figure could more or less double because methane is vastly more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2. And then the bottom one just picks, this is from some data from uh, Gridwatch um, uh, about a few weeks ago, and shows actually how complex the UK grid is. Um, orange is um, combined cycle gas turbine, and actually we need lots of it. Um, wind is blue, and we have lots of power when it's windy. 
fairly obvious, I guess, but actually you know, it, with, with very changeable weather, it's not the most reliable of um, issues. And again, solar in winter is probably better than you might expect, but and is, this, it is there, and solar is actually very helpfully correlated with the peak. But basically in the UK, we have a very, very complicated grid, and we need a huge amount more low carbon power on it. Um, this is some great research done by a guy called Yannick Isakam in now Strathclyde University, ex Leeds University. I did a lot of work with him on behalf of the ICE about three or four years ago, and we were looking at um, the UK's emissions. So the green line or the black line is UK territorial emissions, which are more or less halved. So the carbon we burn on this planet is about 450 megatons at the moment, and it's going in hugely in the right direction. So that's something that we should be really proud about. Consumption-based emissions, though, is the red line on top and highlights the fact that while our electricity grid has pivoted, actually we're still, we, we've also offshored manufacturing. So therefore, um, it's only fallen by about 100 megatons over the period. Therefore, while territorial emissions, which the Climate Change Act talks about, have reduced, we are importing materials from other countries who have their own emissions and therefore um, we're, the world is still a worse place. Again, um, Yannick did some really great data and looked at capital carbon, operational carbon, and user carbon. I'll explain those terms very shortly. But basically, capital carbon is building things. We built about 10 megatons of CO2 per year building things, which is a lot, but actually very small in terms of the emissions from operational and user carbon. So therefore, critically, in our infrastructure systems, we need to pivot the system. Building the right thing, we, have the, we can afford the carbon. This is using terminology from PAS 2080, which gives us the right to actually invest carbon to save carbon. And when we pivot our systems to allow us to live in a much more low carbon way, then it is great that we actually have built the right carbon systems to do that. Making cuts in carbon, the term net zero, I find quite irritating. We need to reduce the carbon in our systems. The rush for everything to be net zero, and again, I'm happy to pick this up in the questions afterwards, um, uh, is, to some extent, an obsession that isn't possible, and therefore people are encouraged effectively to lie. Um, and once people start lying in terms of what they're doing, I think it's not helpful. Um, but once we actually then reach into offsets to try and do it, because actually fundamentally it takes carbon to build anything, and while we might invest something really good to make something happen in terms of building a wind farm or building a nuclear power station, um, the fact that we then say it's got to be net zero in itself, critically, it enables us to live in a much lower carbon way. It doesn't have to be net zero with my large post, um, postulation. Um, so yes, we need to actually build efficiently, but we critically need to make sure we don't just refurbish coal-fired power stations, we pivot our grid to make sure we get power from much better sources. Offsetting is where you actually ultimately end up when you try to get net zero, um, and offsetting there's not many good offsets, there's not a lot of bad offsets, and I read somewhere that we've already sold twice the amount of land to plant trees on for offsetting. And this is before it becomes actually real and before people start doing it in a really big way. So therefore, we need actually much better ways than just tree planting to try and actually change things. So how virtuous is net zero? So yes, if something is genuinely zero, it is really good. And I've just actually done something here looking at some of the overall carbon impact against scale. I showed you the A40 Westway being built. It's huge scale and actually really bad in terms of carbon impact. Not just the carbon that went to build in the motorway, but the fact it was a six-lane motorway dragging cars into the middle of London, and all those cars had to park somewhere, and all the other externalities on civilization and society. Really, really bad for carbon and for society. Looking, say, at H HPC, um, Hinkley Point C nuclear power station, it's about two to five megatons, but it will enable the country to turn off a huge amount of very polluting power sources, and therefore it will pay itself back in a very short period of time. It's a really good investment. HS2 has a slightly mixed pedigree on this. Their own report shows they don't actually save carbon. But once you actually look at what you can do with the liberated train pads and actually put freight on it, then you actually get to a much better place. So it enables a growing up um, process to take place to get to a low carbon system. And everything is a step in the right direction. Everything